Hi everybody, this is Shane R. Monroe, and today we're going to look at the history of the Hot Rod Controller and the Hanahoe Games Company that actually made it. Stick around. So back in the late 90s, early 2000s, the whole concept of home arcade sort of came together. We were offered home versions of games, game packs, we were offered emulation options, and of course you needed some way of playing it and your standard Microsoft Flight Stick or regular game controller wasn't quite cutting it. So a bunch of these sorts of things came out. This is the Hot Rod Ultimate Joystick. And this is a beast, complete with as many buttons as you want, a fully working trackball, two button flippers on the side for playing something like pinball, and it's all made with durable arcade style connectors. And if we were to take a look at the back, and I'll also do some insert videos, I took the back off so you can kind of see what's going on here. This thing is a beast, it's a tank, it is huge, and it is heavy which in some cases makes it a great controller because it doesn't move around while you're playing. This trackball, the keys and everything are actually uh, PS2 style controls. This trackball actually emulates a PS2 mouse. All of these buttons emulate a keyboard stroke. So instead of having to worry about whether your software or your emulator was actually compatible with a given controller, these types of devices actually made it so that if your emulator supported any keystroke on the keyboard, you could duplicate it here. And that's what I've got going on over here. As you can see, I've got my RetroPie. This is the Argon M2, which I reviewed earlier. I'll produce a link for you there so you could take a look at that. Love this, love this Pi case. It served me well. And I've got my favorite, of course, portable monitor here. And I'm using a complete, a completely decked out, um, complete decked out retro high image for that with all the classic games, pretty much a little bit of everything here. I've got everything set up to work with this panel here. So I could actually just get started and play a game for you. I mean, these are arcade controls. But before we do that, let's take a look at the history of the company that made this product. It's actually probably more interesting than you think. Let's take a look. Hanaho Games Incorporated started off as a small company named Semco, which manufactured wooden fishing tackle boxes in 1954. Over the years, they adapted their manufacturing model to expand to newer markets, like store displays for big box retailers like Circuit City, Sears, and Disney in the 1960s and 70s. When the 1980s video game craze hit, Semco acquired a company called Pacific Video Games, with this new merger, they started creating arcade cabinets for companies like Gremlin and Sega, making cabs for games like Frogger, Star Trek, Zaxxon, Dragon's Lair, and Super Off-Road. They also made almost all of Capcom's cabinets. From the merger of these two companies came Hanaho Games, a more arcade home division and distributor of official ROMs for Capcom games. In 2007, Capcom sued Hanaho for a breach of a 1999 licensing agreement which permitted the distribution of their games but only in a very specific circumstance and apparently the games were included on a product Hanaho created called the Hot Rod Embedded Board, whereas the games were originally licensed to be part of a PC package included with the arcade PC. The home market was popular for their arcade cabinets and panel controllers like the Hot Rod for a period of time from 1997 to about 2007 when Hanaho games disappeared from the internet. The last known data from Hanaho reported by Wikipedia is that they developed updated ports of Splatterhouse, Splatterhouse 2, and Splatterhouse 3 for the Splatterhouse reboots in 2010. An interview with Hanaho's frontman Conway Ho is available on the Retro Gaming Radio Definitive Edition collection. Pretty fascinating. I actually got to interview Conway Ho, and uh, I'll have a link to where you could uh, listen to that interview yourself. Anyway, we're back now, and let's take a look. So you can see I've got everything sort of set up here. This is not my image, but uh, I do kind of dig the aesthetics, and it's kind of nice to show off on the screen. So as you can see here, uh, like I said, the controller works really, really well. I mean, obviously this required special configuration and whatnot, but I think it might be time to just actually play for a little while and see how it works out. So I'm gonna stand up here, give you a good look at the controller, 
and I'll do a little inset thing for you. See if I can find something I actually want to play real quick just to show you how it works. How about we do a little narc? Just give me enough buttons to play with. One of those great midway games. Uh, I interviewed Warren Davis recently on Passenger Seat Radio. One of the guys that uh, worked on some of the hardware that helped make this game. Very cool. I am playing this at an angle, so I forgive me in advance. And see all the buttons work great. The problem is my table's wiggly. I know many of you have commented on that. Plus, I'm turned sideways here. Maybe I can just shift this guy this way. Might make this easier. Maybe not. Love busting these guys. Why am I crouched? Dang it. No, it's because I got the wrong button. Get out of here. I must have a button. There must be a button matched to the side there. It's crouching and firing at the same time. No wonder it's freaking me out, but that's okay. It was pretty cool. I mean, it's all arcade controls. It's all arcade quality, which is really, really nice. Exit back out of there. Anyway, it's really nice to have something like this. And of course, um, it would actually even be better if I were to put this on my actual arcade cabinet, also made from uh, the Hanaho folks called Arcade PC. Let's put it up there and check it out. Okay, so we're back in my storage room and there's not a whole lot of space, so I'm feeling a little bit cramped and I think I wore too tight of a t-shirt. So uh, we're gonna have to get through this uncomfortable period together. But this is the Arcade PC. This was the bare bone unit that you could purchase if you already owned a hot rod controller. So um, a few more things I wanted to show you prior to um, putting this all together. I'm gonna move my Pi back here. We're gonna set it up and then we'll see how it works all together. So if I take this guy out of the way, I'm just gonna put the hot rod to the side here. So this was really, really neat. So it comes with this bezel that you can remove and it's very, very clever how they built this thing. And I'll, I'll try to get some video of that. Um, but you have a, a marquee up here. Obviously Mr. Dew didn't come with it. I bought that separately. It did come with its own uh, arcade PC one. Lots of storage space in the back to put a big fat CRT monitor if you wanted to. Back at the time before we had the little flat panels here. This was the uh, area that you would put the hot rod down on or your control panel. And it was really made to fit the hot rod, right? So you could get like a, an X arcade or something like that, but the truth is you'd probably have to modify it to get this um, to behave. Unique though to these cabinets is a keyboard slide out tray, which happens to be holding my Wii controller here because I have a Wii plugged in back there. But you could put down a keyboard and a mouse here, right here on the bottom. So you would actually be able to slide this in and out. So you get your emulator set up, you have to do the weird mouse stuff that doesn't work with the controller. Then you're ready to slide it in and start playing. Down below here, down below here is your PC area where you put all of your stuff, all of your cabling, all of your, your big PC, everything else that would you want. And then there would be a couple of different options for a coin door here. Mine's just a piece of wood that goes in here. I just haven't been able to put my, my hands on it. I think it's out in Shane's shed. And of course it has this big giant sturdy riser. Now, one of the things, one of the things you really need to know about this guy is this is the real deal. This is real T molding. This is not, this is not crappy cheap wood. I'm gonna knock all my crap down. It is, this thing weighs an absolute ton. The riser itself, I think, weighs a phenomenal amount. And, and so altogether, this thing is really beefy, hard to move around, and that's okay because it's kind of cool. But before I go ahead and put everything together, I wanted to show you a couple of things. I've only got one screw holding this guy in up here. Um, poor lighting at the moment. I got my Litralight over here from my other review, my Litralight. So this actually with one, in this case one screw, but there's three up there. You can take this off and there is a fluorescent backlighting available. I've got the bulb out because it burned out, but uh, I gotta go to Home Depot and see if I can replace this. If not, I'll probably have to order from someplace crazy. 
Um, but then you can put whatever marquee you want on here and it's a beautiful backlight. It's not a cheap looking backlight. It looks really, really good. So I wanted you guys to see that because I thought that was really neat, a really neat feature. Now behind, and I'm gonna get the camera and I'm gonna try to show you, but it's gonna be really hard because the lighting is so, so poor back here. Um, there is a speaker compartment back here. All right, so let's take a better look at a couple of these things. So underneath, get out of the light. Underneath you can see some speaker grills, which is pretty neat. And if you go back on top, you can see that there are two uh, portable speakers back here that point downwards onto the grill. And then there's a door that sits over the top. If you wanted to take out the, um, if you wanted to take out this bezel, it just slides right out. You just slide it right up and take it out. So really, really neat. The, the rest of the back is unremarkable. I mean, it's just, it's plain. They did give you some, some side art for the side, but I, I wasn't, I didn't like that side art. I figured I'd put like Dragon's Lair side art or something like that on there. Okay, so this is the whole unit. I'll let you take a look at that little keyboard again. Very nice, durable thing. I've had this thing for decades now and it's managed to stay together pretty well. Some scratches, some buffs from regular wear and tear, but pretty impressive all the same. So one of the things I did not get the opportunity to show you very well was the fact that, oh, this thing weighs a ton. So you noticed on the back when you saw the video that there are two PS2 ports and right off of here is a PS2 cable. So this PS2 cable is tied directly to the trackball as a mouse and these two buttons right here. So these two are mouse buttons left and right, which is pretty neat. But you also need, and I don't know what I'm gonna ever do if I have to try to find another one of these things, but then there is a PS2 cable that plugs in here and then you plug your keyboard in here. So you sort of have a keyboard pass through, which is very nice of them to do because sometimes you need a keyboard to get emulators started or whatever. And last but not least, if you have a modern system like a Pi or something that's before 2005 or after 2005, you're gonna need some way of converting those PS2 signals into USB and enter probably the most expensive thing you'll ever probably have to buy. <laughs> I don't know if they're cheaper now, but back in the day when I had to buy one of these PS2 to USB adapters, this was 50 bucks in like 2003 or whatever the, the date was, but it was a long time ago and not all of them work. They say they're gonna work and they're gonna adapt, but they don't work right. I had to go through like three of them before I found this one. So I'll give you a nice close look there in case maybe you need one and you wanna know the hell it was that actually works on these weird controllers, this is the guy. So now that we have all the pieces together, we've got the Pi, we've got it configured, we've got the hot rod, we've got a nice monitor in here, we've got it all together. I say we put it together and see how well it works. All right, so let's do a quick check-in. We're back behind here. I just went ahead and turned it out. And obviously there are plenty of opportunities for extraordinary cable management going on but we do what we can. So over here, I went ahead and put the Pi right here. This will allow me to reach around the corner and hit the power button on said Pi. And uh, I do have the Y-mouse USB adapter here. I've also plugged in a small keyboard. I'll show you that up front. I have um, the HDMI cable, right? And uh, I do have the power plug and I have a the uh, sound uh, 1 8 inch jack stereo going up to the speakers which is awesome. Everything looks good from here. Uh, of course, the monitor is going to get set up a little bit better back there. Kind of hard to see. And I've moved the Wii and all that good stuff down below. So I think we're ready to actually get sort of a, a shooting solution going here. I've also moved the, uh, the hot rod to the front. I don't have nearly as good a light because I stole my Litra light over there. And so I've put this here and I'll show you some more stuff in the front here in just a minute. But I just kind of wanted to show you that we're, we're making progress. Okay, so here we are. The cabinet is up and running. Obviously, I'm missing this beautiful light-up marquee, which would be amazing. Uh, but I got, the, I got the controller set up. I got my little keyboard just in case I need to type something. And uh, I even plugged in the mouse, but of course, there's nothing to read the mouse right now. So I'll have to set up with some of the emulators. God, I would love to play Missile Command Centipede with this thing. It's going to be amazing. It would be fantastic. I know it. So now, so now I've got the stick all hooked up and I'm actually ready to play. Um, let's do a couple more things here. We're gonna grab this, we're gonna grab this top piece. This top piece here. It's got two little screws and it's got a little thumb hole or finger hole to put that in. 
which is kind of cool to get it out. So I'm gonna go ahead and stick this lid on, button it up. All right, so what the bigger problem I have here is, is there's no way for me to go in and turn the volume up and down. So, I mean, even if I reached over the top, that, that top is on there now. So a lot of times I left it off. And uh, on the sides here, you'll actually see Velcro. Um, at one point in time, I mounted speakers on the sides. That way I could actually adjust the sound. It actually looked okay. I don't think I would probably do that again. But here we are, it's all set up and uh, it's looking great. I'm super excited to be able to get around to playing it. Um, hey, you know what, let's play for a little while. Why not? We're here already, right? Let's see if we can set this guy up and let's see if I can get something off the screen here that's not terrible. Maybe a little uh, Daphne, perhaps. Maybe I could play a little Space Ace. That sounds like fun. That's something you would expect me to play. Am I right or am I right? Right, right, right. Okay. Give you an idea what the sound sounds like, sort of. Um, this is all going through my, my road here, so obviously it's not going to be perfect. I just realized that the button configuration inside of the Daphne emulator may not be all set up because this would be the first time I've run it with this configuration, but we're going to try it anyway. Why not? Maybe I can uh, dim this light a little bit. Oh, I'm not hearing any sound, though. That's bad. I'm not hearing any sound at all. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to get out of that. I guess that's a, a no winner. What's funny is I'm not hearing any sound at all. And I should be. Maybe something got unplugged. So our, our boot up has, our boot up has audio. I don't know if there's any way to actually skip this, but some of these intros are actually pretty cool. It's better when it's not playing Journey's uh, separate ways or something, because that one of those uh, does come up for this. What really needs to happen is there needs to be a key here to skip, and I'm sure there's something. I just don't know what, maybe escape on the keyboard, huh? Nope, you sit through it and you like it whether you like it or not. So we definitely have audio here. Hmm. Let's see if maybe there's a music on off thing I accidentally hit. No, that's this background music disabled. Hmm. Something is awry for sure. Okay, so on a hunch, I went ahead and changed the power supply out of the Raspberry Pi to something a little more beefy with maybe a little PD. And I'm hoping that that'll solve the problem of maybe the music being disabled outside of uh, the video playback here. So let's um, keep our fingers crossed and hope that that's what it was. Hmm. I still no hear no background music. Hmm. I am puzzled. Has to be a configuration thing, right? I screwed something up. Hmm. There's just no music whatsoever. No music, no sound effects. And we just had it working. We were playing NARC and it was working fine. Yay, that's what it was. I had to force the audio through the headphone jack. Very odd though that I didn't have to do it for the video at the beginning. Who, who, who'd have thunk it? Well, that's exactly why I also have a keyboard attached here because my controller wasn't cutting it. Okay, so we are back in business here. We are actually now in a position where we can play something. So let me see if I can get us some decent view here.
So you see part of my problem here is the bezel cuts off part of the screen, but most of the games end up having just a bezel anyway. So it, it actually sort of works itself out, even though it doesn't look like it would. So let's go back to arcade classics here. And uh, I know, I'm sorry, Tim, I was going to show 1943 or something, but uh, you know, uh, this is my video. I should play something I'm actually uh, like kind of excited to play. Um, seeing what I've got here. We could always go back to playing NARC again. Probably be a lot easier being able to see. All right, so one of these buttons will get me the menu. I can just jump to, uh, what was I doing, NARC? There we go. Now let's do some NARCage proper. This light's still really bright. Let me see if I can knock that down one more notch, maybe get a little less glare. All right. Move this over a little bit here. You can just be my player two here. Okay, now we're ready. See what I'm talking about? See how the game itself centers perfectly and there's just, there's just bevel over here around the actual game. So I'm not really... Not really missing out. You've got a nice angle so that you're seeing this side, but you're not seeing this one. And, and frankly, head on, I'm not seeing anything. So it kind of works okay. I do have to take care of that crouch button. I'm not going to be able to crouch and fire at the same time. It's going to make me mental. You're busted. Not used to playing with an actual real arcade controller anymore. Wrong button. Boom. God, is that the greatest thing ever? Hey, don't run. You just die tired, right? Sometimes it's just easier to shoot him. Although you want to bust them in big groups like that. Oh, I'm going to end up dead. It'll be worth it, though. Look at that. God for continues, right? Dang. Brutal. Imagine paying a quarter for this. Show me the money. What a great game, right? We got escape out of there and we're good to go. Listen, I hope you enjoyed taking a look at me putting my cabinet back together, get a little history of Hot Rod and Hanaho, and uh, I'm dying to go play this thing now, so you're on your own. <laughs> Thanks, as always, for watching. Please like, subscribe. You guys know what to do. Thanks again so much for watching. I'm Shane Armand Rowe, and we'll see you next time. I gotta go.